Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. Today's video is going to be a challenge where I'm going to see if I can finish some or all of the books on my 2022 challenge TBRs before the end of the year. As I'm filming this, it's late November, and I have put some things off very late. And, <laughs> and I don't know that I actually can finish all of the books on this TBR, but I want to try to get to as many as I can. And I thought maybe if I did a vlog documenting the process, it will encourage me to actually make it happen. So that is what we're doing. You might remember back in December 2021 when I made my goals video for the year and talked about how I could definitely get to all of these books because it was very reasonable. I had eight books on my classics TBR, eight books on my sci-fi fantasy TBR that I was going to challenge myself to read before the end of the year, just 16 books, so totally doable given how much I read. And how many of them have I read? I, 10, which is not terrible, but I have just over a month left in the year and uh, I still have six books left to read. And you know which books I've put off? Mostly the really long ones. So let's talk about the six books I have left to read to complete that challenge and then we'll see how much of it I can get done. Here we go. Starting off with my classics TBR, the not so long one that I still need to read is The Women of Brewster Place by Gloria Naylor. This is a modern classic. I believe it came out in the 70s and it's about a black women living in a building, I think. I've heard good things. I think there's a mini series. It's not a very long one. I feel like this is super doable. But then I also have Black Reconstruction in America, 1860 to 1880 by W.E.B. Du Bois. And uh, this baby, this baby is like 700 pages long. Uh, I did start part of it. So I've read this much a year ago. We'll see. We'll see if I can do that one. Then to complete my sci-fi fantasy TBR, I have four books to read. It's funny I've done better with the classics than the sci-fi fantasy. I feel like maybe I tried harder because I thought it would be harder to do because I read so much sci-fi fantasy and then look what I'm left with. Look what I'm left with. Okay, so first up we'll start with the two shorter books on the SFF TBR. We have The Female Man by Joanna Roos. This came out in 1975 and it was early feminist science fiction playing with gender stuff. I don't know how well it holds up today, but I want to read it. It sounds intriguing and it is a part of science fiction history. Then I have Dream Ships by Melissa Scott. This is also science fiction. It came out in 1992 and it is by a queer author. So I this is on my list. Also not terribly long, but then we have my two very long and ambitious books. We have Iron Gold by Pierce Brown, which is how long? Uh, 600 pages. This is the first book in the second Red Rising trilogy. I loved the first three books and I have been meaning to get to these for years now and haven't, so I need to read it. And then clocking in at over a thousand pages, we have Words of Radiance by Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> book two in the Stormlight Archive. Oh my god. Uh, okay, so, so all of that to say, these are the six, six books that I have left for me to actually complete my challenges that I set for myself, I would need to read all six of these. I would be happy if I could even read four of them because that's a lot. I do have audiobooks for the three longest ones. So Black Reconstruction in America, Words of Radiance and Iron Gold. This one is super dense. I did start it listening on audio and reading it physically, and it's just gonna take me some time to read, but I, I can do it that way. So I will check back in and uh, we'll see how much of this I can actually do before the end of the year. Wish me luck. Hello, it is December 1st and I finished reading my first book for this challenge, which I, I feel pretty good about, to be honest. The fact that I started this in November and finished it on December 1st, it's like a good solid start to this project. I read Dream Ships by Melissa Scott and I really enjoyed this. It was a little bit of a slow burn. It took me a while to get into it and figure out what was happening with the world, where the plot was going, but eventually 
eventually things really picked up and it turns into quite a riveting sci-fi almost thriller maybe not quite thriller but it has some thriller elements to it the world building is really well thought out and there is a lot of depth to it she has thought through conversation styles ways of communicating different cultural norms it is a society that has class warfare and racism there are political things going on and this does something a little bit different than I've seen before in tackling this question of artificial intelligence and whether whether AI might count as human and if they do what rights they deserve. What's interesting about this is that because there is an underclass of humans who are fighting for their rights to be recognized as full citizens alongside others, they are opposed to this group who is advocating for the rights of AI because they don't want machines to get rights before they do. And so I think that creates a really interesting dynamic in terms of how we think about advocating for equality and justice in a situation where there is another marginalized group that is being left behind in that process. I really enjoyed that. That's not the primary thing that this book is about, but it is one of the themes of the story and it's it's an interesting one. The story follows a bisexual young woman who is a pilot and she gets recruited along with some buddies for a dangerous job piloting an experimental spaceship. And of course some things go wrong and some things happen and I don't want to spoil it, but I quite enjoyed it. I ended up giving this one four stars and I would recommend checking it out. One thing that I will say is kind of fun. This book came out in 1992, so it's been 30 years since this book came out. And especially at the beginning as it was doing some of the technological world building piece, there were things where you could definitely see how where we were at with technology in the early 90s informed some of the choices that were made for the technology of this book. And I don't think an author writing it today would have necessarily made those same choices just because of how far we have come in technological advancements in the past 30 years. So that's not a, not a negative thing, it's just kind of a fascinating thing in terms of reading sci-fi that was written during a specific time and given the technology of that time, the way that the writer might imagine technology would develop from there. So yeah, really liked this, gave it four stars, success. We've got one down and uh, how many more do I have? And five to go. I will check back in once I have completed another book. Hello, I am back with an update. I don't know that now is the best time for me to do this update because I'm very tired because my childhood birthday party today and I kind of need a nap. Also, I'm supposed to go live tonight. I might lay down before that. But I finished reading Black Reconstruction in America, 1860 to 1880. This book is phenomenal. It is such a powerful work of historical nonfiction. It is a tome, but I think it is well worth your time. It is so much information that is usually not taught in schools. And I also just think that Du Bois is such a great writer and there 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 are some surprisingly spicy zingers in this too of uh I was like whew okay you are coming for some people but like in this super intelligent well argued well thought out way but I was like Oof, okay yeah you yep mm -hmm. I think it does a great job of arguing the point that things didn't have to be the way that they were and the way that racism was used to drive a wedge between the poor white people in the South and the newly freed black people in the South who could have worked together for the betterment of all of them, but no, that's not what... Yeah, anyway, it's... I will say because there are chapters that are specifically aimed at different states and goes through their history during this period. And it is wild to me that reading it now in the 2020s, you can still see the impact of the choices that were made way back in the late 1800s today in states in the South. It's really fascinating because you can see such a clear through line to the modern day consequences of the choices that were made and the way that those things continue to play out. And, you know, you see places where you got a picture of what things could have been if it had been handled differently. So, 
yeah, difficult to read at times. It is a lengthy one, and I think the first few chapters in particular are pretty dense with ideas and a little bit harder to parse if you're not paying close attention, but it gets a lot easier to follow if you sort of persevere through it. I I love this. I don't know how I can give this any less than five stars. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know that I can give it less than six stars, which is a favorite of the year. Is this the thing that I had the most fun reading this year? No. But is it something that I think is incredibly meaningful, is going to stick with me, and is something that I could see revisiting and really feel like a lot of people should read or should at least read excerpts from? Yes. I, I just think this is such an important book and like tell me why because this book came out yeah because this book was published in 1935 tell me why some of the things that he's saying could still be said today still need to be said today <laughs> it's just like oof. in some ways we've come farther than we were then but in other ways we're still dealing with the same stuff y'all um Anyway, it's great. It's also very well researched. There's tons of references. I, I would highly recommend this. I know it's daunting. It was daunting for me, which is why I put it off all year long, but I am really glad that I read it. And I'm grateful that I heard about it from Mara over at Books Like Whoa. She read it and it was one of her favorite books. And I was like, well, I clearly need to read it. And then I put it off because it's, it is a lengthy one. Um, the audiobook is good though. I would recommend maybe doing a paired audio physical reading of this one that might be a good way to consume it if you do audiobooks but another one down and uh, this was a chunker so I feel like I'm doing pretty well even though it is December 17th so I don't have a lot of time left but honestly that was probably going to be the most difficult to get through of all of the books on my TBR so the fact that I did yay I was doing it pretty much a chapter a day where I would read or listen to it because I just couldn't it's not one I can just power through there's so much to process and take in you can't just do it all at once I was doing one a day but I have moved on to just barely starting the next book that I'm going to tackle for this and that is Iron Gold by Pierce Brown this one is another lengthy one but I have it on audio and I'm hoping that I can do a blended read of this one of the physical and the audio together and get through it in a relatively timely manner so stay tuned but this is the next one I'm tackling and we'll see how many I can get to before the end of the year. I have some shorter ones that I think will be quick to read once I pick them up which is why I'm like let, let me do my some of my my big boys first and then we'll get to some of the shorter ones later on. So I will check back in once I've made some progress on Iron Gold or if I pick up another one and I'll let you know how it goes. I want to do a little bit of an update on Iron Gold because I'm kind of struggling with it to be perfectly honest. I feel like I really should have read it sooner after finishing the first trilogy because I would have remembered more and had more momentum and maybe would have been more invested or have done a reread but I just don't have the time or motivation to do a reread so we are where we are. I'll be honest, I'm a little bit bored, which is maybe a controversial take. It's okay. Like, there are parts of it that are, are interesting. I like the concept. I like the idea of looking at, okay, what happens 10 years in the future after a revolution and did it actually achieve the aims that you set out? So, like, as a project, I think it's interesting, but the actual reading experience so far has been a little dull. Looking at reviews, it's a mixed bag. Some people think this is like the best thing since sliced bread. And some people were more middle of the road. I saw one review where somebody said they felt like it was kind of slow paced until the last third of the book. So I'm like, oh no. Oh no. <laughs> like, is this gonna be like this until the last third? And maybe the final third somewhat makes up for it. I don't know. I All I know is that right now, it's not really the thing I want to be reading. Uh, I'm going to do it. I'm pushing through, but I'm kind of struggling. So I just thought I would do a quick update and let y'all know. We'll see how it goes. I finished reading Iron Gold and it definitely picked up. I liked it a lot better once I got about a third of the way into this book. So that's a relief because I was struggling, as you saw <laughs> for the first part of it. It definitely picks up quite a lot. The payoff is really good and there are some twists and yeah, 
I, you know, I'm not going to spoil anything, but the ending is very, very good. It is interesting because it's the first time we're getting Pierce Brown writing from various perspectives. All the previous books were just from Darrow's perspective. And while he continues to be a perspective in this book, except 10 years later, um, as a father who's questioning his ability to be a good father, I, which I think he's done really well. But we get three additional perspectives as well. We have Lyria, who's a young woman who is a red. She's really scrappy and has dealt with a lot of difficult things. I love her. I really like her character. I liked her perspective from the very beginning. I think she was probably my favorite of all the new perspectives. We have Ephraim, who was a side character in previous books. And he grew on me at the beginning. I was like, eh, okay, but I ended up really liking him and I found his character arc to be quite compelling. Speaking of which I'm very curious to see what happens with Lyria in the future because she's smart but sweet but has had some bad things happen and I you know given how dark things tend to get for people <laughs> and how brutal the world is I'm curious to see what her character arc is going to be. And then the final new perspective is Lysander uh, who I really didn't care for. I found myself being pretty uninterested in most of his chapters and I'm sure it didn't help that I also didn't love the narrator for the audiobook for his chapters either. There are several narrators, one for each perspective, but I wasn't too fond of the person that they had for Lysander and I just kind of... I yeah I found myself kind of bored through those sections but there are a lot of really big things that happen some interesting political things and interpersonal dynamics it's interesting to see some of our favorite characters from previous books now as parents and that dynamic was kind of cool to watch unfold and just generally I like this concept of how politics actually works that there's a revolution but then what comes next and is it everything you thought it was going to be? Or are people still being harmed by the systems that are currently in place? And I think we get some difficult answers to those questions in here. And it is rough to see Darrow kind of having something of a downfall. There is a big sort of cliffhanger ending. I'm interested to move on and read Dark Age. And hopefully I'll get to that one a lot faster than I got to this one. I didn't realize just how long it had been. This came out in 2018 and I bought it when it first came out. So um, yeah, it's uh, been a minute. I do think I probably would have been more invested from the beginning if I had done a reread of the series or read this sooner to when I finished it. But you know what? It is what it is. I'm still glad that I got to it. I enjoyed it and I gave this book four stars. So not a perfect book. I think the fact that the first third of it dragged so much for me and the fact that there was one character perspective that I just consistently wasn't super interested in. This wasn't a new all-time favorite but four stars I think what was good was very good. Hello I am back. It is New Year's Eve and I'm here to talk about the women of Brewster Place which I finished a couple days ago but we were traveling in Louisiana for the holidays. I didn't read much while I was there to be perfectly honest. I finished this and I finished one other book and made a little progress on some other things. It's okay though. I had a really good time. I want to talk about this and then I might be back hopefully I might be back later today to talk about one more book that I think I can finish before the year is up. Brandon Sanderson is not gonna happen, which I, I, I predicted at some point in this video that I probably wasn't gonna get through all of those huge tomes. So I feel like I've actually done a pretty good job considering. Uh, Words of Radiance, we're gonna probably move forward into next year, but I do still want to read it. That said, The Women of Brewster Place this was so good and it's not the kind of thing I would normally pick up. I think this is the sort of book that I love these kinds of challenge TBRs for because they get me to read things that aren't my normal wheelhouse, right? This is kind of hard-hitting semi-literary fiction that is a modern classic. This came out in 1982. And it's not the kind of thing that I would pick up on a regular basis. It's not sci-fi fantasy. It's not, you know, kind of my typical fare, but it's so, so good. And I'm really glad that this is something that made me get to it. The Women of Brewster Place is a novel that is told in seven interweaving stories. Each story is following 
a black woman who lives in this building called Brewster Place. And you know, it's a beautifully written book that I think does a good job of observing the lives and humanity of a group of very different women with different experiences. And it is a book that feels very, very human. It deals with some trauma and intense subject matter. It also has moments of lightness and humor and love and friendship. Um, there was one chapter in particular that was very difficult to get to. There's some big content warnings for this book, y'all. I'm not gonna lie, I put some of them in my Goodreads review, but one thing I will say is that there is a chapter focused on a lesbian couple who are trying to kind of keep a low profile uh, in a world that is incredibly homophobic. And I think reading this 40 years later, I see how in some ways we've come so far from where things were, but at the same time we're still dealing with some of the same stuff. Their story is tragic and ends with pretty horrific homophobic violence and sexual assault um, against one of the women in particular. And I think the reader is left wondering, what if, what if something else happened? What if things weren't like that? But it does feel very human. I think if this was written today, there would probably be a criticism of like falling into the barrier gaze trope and not that that didn't maybe happen then too. It doesn't feel like it's what this book is trying to do though. It, I, I don't know, I'm sure there's been some criticism of it, but I think reading something that came out 40 years ago, it feels like it may have been revolutionary for the time that it was written. But yeah, it follows all of these women who've been through a lot of stuff and it's hard to read at times, but it's also so evocative and yeah. I don't know. I was told that this was turned into a mini series. I wonder how much of what's on the page here is in the mini series because I feel like that would be difficult to watch if there was as much on screen graphically depicted as there is on page. Yeah. I guess one interesting thing about this too is because I had looked into getting the audiobook for it and for whatever reason the only audiobook is abridged and it doesn't say it's abridged but if you start reading it alongside the audiobook it skips over chunks of it which is so weird I don't know why that is but I would definitely recommend this if you can deal with some of the content I think it's very very good and I also think it's interesting because it spans various periods of history because it is following women from different generations and some of them it's talking about their childhoods and how they ended up in Brewster Place. What's also cool about this is that the stories interweave because they are in each other's lives and live in the same space, but also Brewster Place, this building, is a character itself. It's given the sense of life and it is a story that centers women and the lives of women and all the men in the story are pretty peripheral to their lives for the most part. They play some kind of a role, but the strongest relationships that they have and the most constant relationships that they have tend to be with other women. Anyway, I loved it. I gave it five stars. I would definitely recommend checking it out if it has been on your radar. Not my usual fare, but I am so glad that I read it. And I think it's a nice way to end out a year picking up something that is a little challenging. I am hoping to finish reading The Female Man before the end of the day. I am almost halfway through it and I think I can maybe finish it. I'm gonna tell you, this book is an experience. Um, I don't know that I'm necessarily enjoying reading it for the most part, although it has its moments. It's weird and sometimes very uncomfortable, but it's got some interesting ideas. I'm kind of glad I'm reading it because I feel like it's it's something that's worth reading for the place it holds in feminist sci-fi history and some of the ideas of the time it was written. Um, but definitely not going to be a new favorite. I will try to get through the rest of this today and check back in and tell you a little bit more about this before we wrap up this vlog. Hello, it is January 2nd. I did finish reading this very, very early morning January 1st, but like that same night, so I'm counting it. Um, I just, I've been tired, it's been a whirlwind, there's been a lot going on, but I'm finally here to give you my thoughts on The Female Man and wrap up this reading project. So I think I said this before, but this was interesting to read, not always super enjoyable. It definitely has some things that are a product of its time. This came out in, I think I might have said this wrong last time, but it came out in 1975. And there are things like racial slurs, 
Um, there is an extended scene that I was very uncomfortable with how it was handled that it kind of boils down to child sex abuse with a much older woman and a pubescent girl, but it's not really treated that way. It's called a taboo, but it's not treated as assault in the narrative. So I didn't love how that was handled. Uh, but I do think there are a lot of really interesting ideas in this book. So even though the structure of it is confusing to read, it is hard to like piece together all of what you're supposed to be getting out of it sometimes. I'm not mad that I read it. I ended up giving it three stars. I think as a a piece of literature at the intersection of second wave feminist ideas and science fiction, it's interesting, right? And I think if that intrigues you, it might be worth picking up if you're interested in kind of the history of those things and something at their intersection this is is worth a read. Would I recommend this as something just to read on a whim for fun and escapism? No, <laughs> probably not. This I think is more something that's interesting for the ideas it's playing with situated within the time it was written than it is kind of on its own merits, at least in my opinion. Again, I'm not sure what I said earlier, but this does follow four women who you eventually figure out, it takes a while to get there, but you eventually figure out that they're, they're kind of like multiversal versions of each other, who for sci-fi reasons end up encountering each other in different times and places and interacting. And in some ways, I think this book is a novel about being a lesbian or maybe bisexual, but probably lesbian, at least in the way that it was thought of during this time. And showing various toxic ways of coping with that identity. So all four of the women have J names. You've got Joanna, Janine, Janet, and JL. <laughs> so all J names. But Janine lives in this alternate version of Earth, lives as a librarian, is in a relationship with a man that she has kind of like mixed feelings about and it becomes pretty clear that she's probably a repressed lesbian that she's repressing that side of herself. Joanna, who is the same name as our author, is a feminist in the 1970s in a world much like our own, trying to make it in a man's world and dealing with what it means to be a woman or a man. The ideas about gender are definitely outdated. We've come a long way in the way that we think about gender and gender identity. But again, it's something that's interesting to think about for the time that this was written. Janet is from a very, very different Earth where all the men died out because of a virus and it's just all women. And at first glance, it appears like it's supposed to be this utopia. But the more you see of her world, the more you realize it's not actually a utopia. And so it's a world that is very sex positive and a world that is totally fine with women having sexual relationships with each other, but emotionally intimate and romantic relationships are like at best seen as embarrassing or juvenile. And so it's interesting because it's a world that embraces lesbian sexuality, but divorces it from emotional intimacy and makes marriage not a romantic partnership, but more of a practical one. So that entire setup is fascinating. I'm probably, I was probably most interested in Janet's perspective in this, partly because there's a lot of intriguing things about the world that she comes from, but partly because when she is in worlds more similar to our own with these, you know, 70s level gender conventions and expectations, the way she reacts to them kind of underlines the absurdity of them in some ways, which I think is fun. JL, we don't see as more than a shadowy presence until the last couple chapters of the book, but she exists in this sort of futuristic version of Earth where there's body modifications like being invisible or having claws, and men and women are literally at war with each other, and she has this male sex slave who's partially lobotomized, and clearly it's commentary on expectations of women being, you know, kind of happy sex bots except flipping the gender. So there's a lot of interesting ideas playing around here, but the experience of reading it isn't necessarily the best. You know, I think some of that's intentional. She's very experimental in the writing style, the narrative structure. It is going to drive some people bananas and they will not enjoy it. 
but I'm glad that I read it. I'm glad I put it on this challenge TBR. It was an experience and this was my very last book of 2022. What a way to end a year like 2022, but with the female man. So to wrap everything up, I feel really good about this project. I did not read Words of Radiance by Brandon Sanderson. I'm rolling that over into 2023. I still want to read it, but that thousand plus page book just did not happen in the time I had left at the end of the year. That said, I got through more than I expected to. The fact that I read five of the six books on this TBR when three of them were as long as they were, I feel very good about. And I had a pretty positive experience with all of these books. I mean, even though The Female Man was a three star read, it, it was still interesting. I didn't hate it. And I'm not mad that I read it. So there you go. That was me trying to complete this challenge. I didn't complete it for the SFF TBR, but I came pretty damn close and I feel great about it. So talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video, these books. Have you ever tried doing a challenge like this for yourself and how does it work out for you? I do enjoy it. I like having yearly challenge TBRs to push me to read things I wouldn't otherwise pick up and this was fun. So talk to me in the comments down below. If you guys like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.